Hello everyone, my name is Dr. Aaron Peel, and I welcome you back to the Hush House Lectures. Today's lectures, we'll be discussing the nature of the hours. I presume everyone here is at least somewhat familiar with the concept of the hours. Most practical occultists and magicians call upon them regularly by ritual and sacrifice to provide assistance in their magical workings. Some of the hours have cults devoted to them like the Church of the Unconquered Sun for the solar powers and the Sisterhood of the Triple Knot for a variety of feminine, usually based hours. And of course, some hours are feared and shunned as their attention can bring unwanted negative effects such as madness, death, or far, far worse. But what are the hours? If you attended my previous lecture, we briefly discussed the dimensional structure of reality as defined both by the material sciences within the dimensional membrane model and the metaphysical sciences in the many realms mythic structure. This model included higher dimensional realms that define the nature of our own physical and spiritual reality, realms that are occupied by dimensional intelligences. Some of those intelligences are beings that humanity defines as the hours, but also other beings such as gods, spirits, fae, and demons. To explain this further, let's use a model of reality you may already be familiar with, the Kabbalistic Tree of Life. You may already be familiar with this concept through your occult studies or its use in popular fiction. I'm looking at you, ne Neon Evangelion fans. The model is a vertical representation of the relationship between the higher dimensional realities and our physical world. At the top of the chart is the infinite and unknowable essence of divinity. The tree refers to this dimensional state as Keter, but other systems give it different titles. For example, the Mansis refers to this state as the glory. Other esoteric systems give it such titles as the Godhead, Source, the Monad, the One, etc. However, the principle remains the same. However, the limited human, near-human, mortal, and immortal perspective cannot conceive of this infinite state, and thus, to see the Godhead directly without protection would destroy a person's mind, and anyone attempting to tap into that infinite energy of the Godhead directly would be instantly destroyed by energies beyond their comprehension and control. Thus, the divine state of being must be concealed behind multiple layers or veils to be stable enough to manifest a world as concrete as this one that would be inhabitable such to physical individuals as we are and to have magical energies at a level that we can work with safely. In the Tree of Life model, each horizontal layer represents one of these layers or veils through which the infinite potential of Keter steps down to a more stable state of being, like how, well, the raw voltage produced by your power companies running through the electrical wires outside your house needs to be stepped down to a level that isn't going to instantly fry your toaster when you plug it in. Eventually, the energy reaches the bottom at Malkoth, which is our physical world, and, well pretty much stays here. Each one of these levels has one or more Sephiroth or domains inhabited by spiritual rulers of the concepts that these domains embody. They take the spiritual potential that descending from the layer above and shape that potential to a more concrete fashion, then give that product to the layer beneath them until the process ends here in the material realm with the reality that we are familiar with. Now, if this model seems a little familiar, it should. The Mansis is a similar model, with the infinite glory at its top and multiple layers below it that it descends through to reach our material world. Now, each of the five levels below it is categorized usually by the dream gate that you require to access that area. Um, these are, of course, the peacock door, the spider door, the stag door, the white door, and finally the wood. Now, the wood is the dream analog of our own material world, and from there, the energies pass through into our world. Each layer also, of course, has concrete domains that are often but not always inhabited by associated dimensional intelligence. For example, the Colonel guards the Worm Museum. The seductive children of the Grail wait for their next prey within the Red Church. The Forge works for eternity within the Mallory. You can see the parallels between the two systems. Allow me to demonstrate how this works. Let's imagine the universe at a higher dimensional state looks something like this. Do your mind understand it? Could you interpret this space enough to be able to navigate or utilize it in any way? But let's step down 
this image to the lower dimensional representation of this space, then suddenly it's familiar. You can make out landmarks within it, stars, planets, galaxies. It all fits a model your conscious mind can comprehend. You create patterns to map this space in your mind through constellation of stars with a model of the solar system. You can even attribute these models with myths and stories as mimetic aids to help you find them again and understand their significance. When you know that the star Polaris always points to the north, you can navigate by it. When you know when a certain constellation appears in the horizon, the weather will turn cold, then you know to start preparing food for winter. Thus, we map the infinite with our finite systems to better understand them. We limit the world through our limited perceptions to be able to understand it enough to function within it. So we do the same to the dimensional intelligence within these higher realities. We condense them down from an abstract intelligent force to a form that if not precisely human-like, at least in a form that a human can better understand and interact with. Now imagine you're trying to interact with a dimensional entity in its truest form as a fractal entity within a higher dimensional domain. If you could contact them and get them to understand you somehow, could you even understand them if they chose to reply? But what if we made a simpler pattern out of this more complex one, one more easy to grasp? Might we understand at least an aspect of this being earlier? No, not quite concrete enough. Maybe we could drop it down in complexity once more. One more time. Ah, that's better. Now this is a form that most of you can conceive of. Mother Nature, the Earth Mother, Gaia. By limiting our perspective of this greater intelligence to a singular aspect of their being, we can understand them. Well, better. We, this is also why we speak of the hours and similar beings of having aspects, parts of their being that represents different parts of this larger entity. Part of successfully interacting with these entities is to ensure that you get the right aspect. The aspect of the Earth Mother that is the flowering Earth of spring or the ripe fields of summer is far different in the winter aspect that draws flesh back into her embrace by cold death. Make sure you have the aspect that you want. What of the act of ascension, though? Many of you, after all, are on such a path to involve into a dimensional intelligence yourself using arcane studies and practices. This is a process of both raising your dimensional state and aligning with the abstract energies of higher dimensions through symbolism. It is important to do both. Merely raising your vibrational state without having a focus for them will simply result in an unfocused state of fascination that can be fatal to one's sanity. To align with the symbols of higher dimensions without doing the work, though, uh, to raise one's vibrational state is becoming a fetishist, adorning oneself with pentacles and runes with no connection to the forces behind them. A tree of life can be printed on a t-shirt, but wearing it doesn't make you an initiate of occult secrets. To give an example of this process, let's take a known path of ascension, that of the heart-based dancer route. This route requires aligning with the energies associated with the bearer of the cosmic heart, the thunder skin, the cosmic fires of desire, the dance of life, the drum echoing the heartbeat of creation. These symbols utilized by the dancer will cause them to align to the energies of the thunder skin. And by doing them with, as a series of ritual dances in various places of power across the world, the dancer absorbs that energy to raise their own vibrational state. In the case of a successful ascension, the dancer leaves behind their mortal frame and becomes a dimensional intelligence bound to the thunderskin. So from this to this to something akin to this. Now, in the future, when some initiate attempts to contract the now transformed mortal for their assistance, the initiate will condense the image of this new dimensional intelligence into something that they can interpret rather than something based on the dancer's original form. So depending on the nature of the individual looking at the ascended dancer, the dancer's spirit could look to them like this or this. So if anyone in here in the audience manages to ascend, do keep in mind that if a mortal averts their eyes to your transformed form and cowers, it's really more them than you. And now you know why spiritual messengers usually open with the be not afraid, it's an occupational hazard. So thus, we come to the Hours, a collection of living, transcendent principles, primal spiritual beings from archaic ages of creation, mortals who've stolen or earned spiritual status, and even less definable entities beyond even the other Hours comprehension. 
In future lectures, we'll have the opportunity to take a closer look at these fascinating and terrifying beings and break them down by their origins, that of the nowhere, the light, stone, blood, and of course, flesh. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. Please, of course, if you feel so moved, and perform your like, share, and subscribe rituals on the way out. I'll be taking questions in the comments section down below and we'll answer them as best I can. If you like this series, please consider becoming a supporter. Supporters get to vote on the subject of the next lecture and have early access to lectures and other episodes. So, until next time.